Okay. Friends, members and guests of the German American Business Association uh, in California. My name is Peter Bayer and I'm way to you from Berlin. I'm standing in the Bundestag, the Parliament, the Federal Parliament of Germany here in Berlin. Um, I'm a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and have been a member of the German Bundestag for over 11 years now. And I'm also the transatlantic coordinator of Germany's government. I'm happy to be here with you. Thanks for the invitation. I expect from the new Joe Biden administration a much better and improved and normal um, transatlantic friendship as allies should treat uh, each other. Um, and with regard to the topics, it's a full range of topics, a whole portfolio ranging from trade, security and defense, digitization, the Arctic, China and many other things. So whatever you're interested in, uh, a, in the field of transatlantic relations and beyond, let me know. I'm looking so much forward to the discussion we're having in the next one, one and a half hours. Wonderful. Welcome everybody to the SCABA virtual roundtable. I am Wolfram Dolker, chairman of the uh, board of directors of the Southern California chapter of GABA, the German American Business Association. And I will be moderating this event today. We are planning to give uh, Mr. Bayer about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, a window uh, with a few moderated questions on four key, let me say time windows of ex his experiences and his thoughts uh, on the future. Window one, Peter Bayer uh, as transatlantic coordinator in the year 2020, Trump, Corona, travel ban, um, how, how has that all worked out? Um, second window will be the current situation, transition, uh, Trump, Biden, uh, what's happening right now? How does this, how does it, this affect it and how does he uh, see this from his perspective? Window number three then is the expectations. He just mentioned it um, of a new Biden administration after the inauguration. And uh, number four, um, I, I'd like to um, ask him about uh, what I call the Peter Bayer doctrine. He has uh, published uh, an interesting article uh, not too long ago uh, with his vision uh, of, of Europe uh, in the post Trump area. After this, we will. Uh, open up the forum uh, for questions and possible and possible discussion. Uh, now, before we get started, a few rules of engagement. Uh, at this time, all of you uh, have been muted. We would ask everyone to turn on their cameras if you can. When it comes time for questions or discussion, we will not call on participants with their cameras off. We do recommend to use the speaker view um, function during this event, uh, but that's up to you, of course. The chat function uh, will be turned on throughout the event. We have already received some questions uh, with the registrations, uh, but feel free to put some questions into the chat. Uh, part of our GABA uh, team here, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Catherine Hager. Catherine, say beep. So we can see you. Hello, everyone. Um, Welcome. Who is the who is the main administrator uh, of our Zoom platform? If there are any technical issues, uh, feel free to chat her. And then there's Jim Chow. Jim, yeah. uh, also known as uh, JJ, he's a member of our Southern California board and our regional director for the San Diego region, and he will be monitoring and help moderate uh, questions from the chat function. And allow me to recognize one more special guest who is with us today, another representative of the uh, German Foreign Service team of uh, Heiko Maas, uh, Stefan Schneider, I believe is here. Yes, 
He's the uh, Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany here in Los Angeles uh, with responsibility for all of Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, and uh, Utah. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. Um, you may learn a little bit from uh, Peter Bayer today, I hope. Uh, he is closer to Heiko Maas and the everyday uh, workings of, uh, of the uh, government. So uh, this should be an interesting uh, session also for you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me please introduce Peter Bayer. He's a regular uh, in our GABA Southern California program. Uh, always good for some fascinating behind the scenes uh, views and stories. Uh, he was born on Christmas Day of 1970 in Ratingen in Germany, uh, north of Dusseldorf in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, he served in the German military, uh, then went to law school in Dusseldorf and Bonn, uh, admitted to the German bar in 1999. Uh, after uh, get, getting his uh, German uh, exam, he came to the United States. Uh, to practice law in three law firms across the country. Uh, last one was Merchants and Uncomings uh, here in Los Angeles. Uh, so I know he loves uh, palm trees and I put up the right picture for him today here behind me. Uh, he took up postgraduate studies and graduated with a Master of Law from Virginia Law School, uh, Virginia School of Law in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, before returning to Germany, working as uh, IP intellectual property specialist uh, in the bio law firm in Rottingen in his hometown. Like so many of us, uh, he got hooked to the American dream in the United States while, while he was here. And it, it shows bright and clear um, until today. Uh, we love to have him uh, since 2009. Uh, he's been elected to the um, as a member to the German parliament, to the Bundestag. Uh, and for the last three federal elections, he was overwhelmingly elected directly uh, into the Bundestag by his, his constituents, uh, his constituents around uh, rot rotting in his hometown. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with a roaring, some roaring virtual applause here, uh, Peter Bayer for today. That is so kind, thanks so much. <laughs> All right, I believe we have just, um, I believe we've just seen you uh, from your castle in the Bundestag, um, but I, I do believe uh, you are today at your home office in your constituent uh, district, uh, number 105 in Mittmann uh, in North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, so, Let's start with uh, subject number one. Tell us a little bit how you have experienced the, the COVID uh, travel ban times uh, and what's been going on. You were here last uh, in 2019. So tell us a little bit what has happened uh, in the last eight or nine months and how you have felt it uh, restricted from uh, coming to your, your beloved United States for so long. Wolfram, thank you so much. And thanks especially for putting up this uh, palm trees and the Hollywood sign. Makes me a little bit jealous and uh, longing for coming back as soon as I can. You know, the fun thing is that um, I, I booked and planned completely a, a business trip to Los Angeles and then further on uh, uh, to Vancouver. Um, just on the day, the travel ban uh, was uh, you know uh, was going into effect, so I, I, I must have been around I don't know 16th or 17th of March, so that would would have been the last time to travel to the United States and to, to Los Angeles. But you know I had to cancel that. But let me first uh, thanks uh, thank you for the invitation. Thanks uh, to Gaba, uh, you're an old friend personally and many familiar faces. Uh, when I read the names in the audience, um, I hope that I can come back um, uh, in, <coughs> in not too far future. Uh, special hello to the Council General, Herr Schneider. Uh, <laughs> we were both smiling, Wolfram. Uh, of course, you are right. When you said, you know, I'm so much closer to Heiko Maas, 
yes, he's also a member of parliament and his office actually is just like on the same corridor in the, in the, in the same building. But uh, I never ran into him <laughs> in two and a half years since I occupied this position as transatlantic coordinator. <laughs> I see him at the plenary hall. We are colleagues. I see him when he has appearance in the Foreign Relations Committee, where I'm also a member. So um, yes, we know each other, but we are not like, like on a daily basis. We all have our responsibilities. But um, yeah, um, <laughs> thanks, thanks for that question. I mean, how's, how's the time treated me? I mean, not so much different, I guess, um, from, uh, from you know, how you experience these times. I mean, I was following very closely since I couldn't travel to the United States, which I usually do like uh, once a month um, <coughs> for, for quite some time now. So I was observing very closely the media, the internal reports that I get, a lot of video conferences, a lot of uh, uh, telephone calls, WhatsApps and <coughs> emails. So I try to um, keep in touch somehow, which was in the beginning difficult. In the beginning, you know, when the lockdown he started also around the mid of March, I never thought I have to admit, quite frankly, I never thought that actually there would come a second wave. I ignored this. I said, well, when, when it's getting better, when it's improving, we're probably um, safe. And I never thought it would be even worse than the first time. Yes, we've learned a lot over the course of these over half a year now. Uh, a lot of mistakes had been made before. Nobody really knew the, the virus, uh, the scientists not, but you know, a lot of money and time was invested. A lot of you know, also international cooperation uh, uh, to do research on that damn thing. Um, so, I mean, you've heard probably today that, <clears throat> they, that they announced in, in the UK to start uh, with the, you know, to distribute the vaccine uh, 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 very, very in due course. Um, so that was like rocket started for the vaccine research. Um, that, that was a good thing. Uh, but I, I mentioned already a lot of mistakes have been made. If you don't know a, situ a certain situation and no, nobody knew um, you know, what was, was this all about, um, that sh shouldn't really come as a surprise that we need to learn a lot and people learn politicians learn, people learn to live with that. And I have also to say, um, <clears throat> a, to a very, very large extent, the, um, you know, that, that there was quite a good management and the crisis in Germany, <clears throat> you know, we, we, did, we, we did quite well with regard to, this, to, to, to the infection numbers and the increase of the numbers. I mean, we have high numbers now, but, um, you know, that it was okay. Uh, we didn't have so high numbers uh, of, of casualty you know, deaths that de de deaths uh, was uh, was to a large uh, extent the success of the people um, because they they understood uh, maybe instinctively that something uh, evil was coming their way something maybe even fatal yes you have those um, Folks who will go to, onto the street don't believe that the virus actually exists, and you know that it's made up. It's fake news, or very sinister. I don't know what, but um, but the vast, vast, vast majority really plays by the rules. Understands that still uh, in this second lockdown that we're currently in, and <clears throat> the chance for just uh, um, uh, uh, announced today, just not, not not long ago, maybe one or two hours ago. Um, that the, uh, the lockdown restrictions will be extended out to 10th of January. I just heard that Austria also, <coughs> um, you know, did some additional uh, 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 additional lockdown restrictions. So with regard to go ski vacations, if, if you want to go skiing in the Alps, it's at least not in Austria. It's not probably not possible <laughs> because when you come from a risk area, hotspot, Corona hotspot, um, you have to, if you cross the border from Germany to Austria, you would have to go to, into quarantine for 10 days. So why going there anyway? So, you know, on a day-to-day -day business, my life has changed, obviously. Usually when I don't have session weeks in Berlin, when we, have to, when we are in session with the parliament, which is our, you know, an average about two weeks a month, uh, uh, I'm, I'm otherwise here at home in my district, uh, consisting of four cities actually, you know, from, from, from overnight, there was zero, nothing, no events, meetings, nothing, um, uh, which was also um, awkward. And I, I myself also had to learn 
uh, how to deal with that. Uh, we sat together with my team, did, my, did brain, brainstorming and came up with some ideas, did a lot of videos stuff in the beginning. So um, I, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time staying inside my private apartment, doing video conferences, um, uh, a lot with the, with the American friends, um, uh, with the Western Balkans. Um, also, by the way, it's an, uh, it's an excellent example of transatlantic cooperation with the Western Balkans, EU enlargement and stuff, uh, which I'm very active uh, with, with, with that topic. And obviously also with my party members here, because I, you know, if you are away for a long time, people, you know, they, they need to see you. You have to be present at a, as an elective politician, the, 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 the normal citizens, but also the party members. And so I'm doing a lot of stuff there as well to make offers. And, um, you know, in the beginning it was a little bit slow, but now people learned over the course of the, of the, of the, of the months, um, how to, you know, how to use these equipments. Uh, so it's, we are fine, but I also see, and that's my, my final remark uh, with regard to your first question, Wolfram, is that people uh, you know, get are increasingly getting annoyed by not really meeting physically in person. It, it confirms that uh, the human being is a is a you know uh, is, is is a social is a social human being. We need each other. I mean, as much as I love to see you guys out there, uh, of course it would have been, something is missing. And uh, maybe the last thing I wanted to add here is um, that <clears throat> some of the, I mean, transatlantic, uh, transatlantic uh, relations, uh, you know, our friendship across the Atlantic, the partnership with friendship has come under enormous pressure over the past four years. Um, and especially during this year, which was also, you know, this very interesting, <laughs> A presidential uh, campaign and, and the elections, uh, governors and Senate and House and so on. Um, it, it, I think there was a lot of misunderstanding uh, of, for, from our side of the Atlantic. It would have been so much easier to be able to travel and talk to colleagues, to normal people. Um, you know, the, the example that three senators wrote a letter to a, to a port authority <laughs> In the north of Germany, because of Nord Stream Two, this pipeline project um, that's supposed to uh, bring um, the gas, the supplies with gas from Russia, that letter I, I, I'm very, very sure would have never been sent uh, uh, if we could have met before in person. And I, I know these three senators quite well, especially Ron Johnson, who was one of those three. And I met him the last time here in Germany at the Munich Security Conference uh, in February. We talked about many things, but you know. Um, even with, 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 with telephone calls or videos, you are losing track and really um, the traction as well. Um, so I think there were, were a lot of missed opportunities to straighten things out. Um, that has caused additional damage to the transatlantic uh, uh, co coordination and cooperation. But you know, here we are, we can deal with that. And we're up for, 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 better, for better times, I hope. All right, great. Um, before we move to window number two, which is the current time, the, the transition period after the election, um, I'd like to take uh, a few minutes. And uh, Jim, if you don't mind bringing back up uh, the slide that we had initially. Peter, you have all these fascinating titles. And um, wow. at, at every event, uh, we spent um, uh, some time coordinating to make sure that everything is right and is correct because it changes. Um, so let's go through them really quick uh, and, and help us understand what these different functions are. In general, I think it's safe to say you are wearing two different hats. You're wearing the hat of the German government, which is your transatlantic coordinator uh, function. And you're wearing, of course, the head of your, uh, as being a, a member of German parliament and you are in different committees uh, so um, let's go through them. Um, I, I do have them here. <laughs> Member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, Special Rapporteur on Transatlantic Relations and Western Balkans. That's a committee of the Bundestag, correct? Exactly. The, the Bundestag um, has, I think, 20, 22 committees. Actually, only four um, are named in our constitution, the Grundgesetz. So four, that's uh, European affairs, foreign affairs, defense, 
I don't know. No, no. It, it's 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 European Affairs, Foreign Affairs, um, Petitionsausschuss. How would you call that? Petition. Petition. And uh, and um, uh, well, maybe it was defense. Yeah, I think it's right. It's defense. So these four are actually stated in our constitution. They they cannot you know that they have to be there after ever uh, each and every general elections. Um, but of course, without the rest, um, at least uh, the, 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 the majority of the, of the, of the, of the rest, um, also we could, would not really be able to work. I mean, we, are, uh, we, we work basically through the committees, which are really important. Uh, the committees um, are like, like mini uh, plenaries, you know, it's, they are composed like the, the whole thing, like the whole plenary when we debate, like the whole Bundestag. So those who have the majority <clears throat> also um, have, not, not in all cases, not in every uh, uh, committee, but in general, um, you know, also um, uh, have the chair. Um, but uh, there are exemptions, as, uh, of course, especially when it comes to the budget committee. It's always chaired by a person coming from the opposition. And we have six uh, parties, uh, parliamentary groups this time in the Bundestag, so not a two-party system. We have six currently in the Bundestag, and it's just a little bit in less than a year from now, namely on, the, on September 26th next year, we'll have uh, another general elections. Um, I'm running again. Um, Angela Merkel is not running again, <laughs> so there will be big changes with regard to personnel, at least. Um, yeah, let's see, it's gonna be interesting times, but the committees are important. With the, 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 the major work in the parliament is done in and by the committees and only in the last steps of a legislative process, um, you know, it's brought, uh, for, for example, a, a, a bill is uh, debated in the plenary hall under the, uh, under the glass dome in the Reichstag building. So um, all the arguments are very well known when that happens already because we have uh, been busy with the issues uh, at least weeks, most of the times months before, and uh, yeah, that's the way we do that. And you, you are the special rapporteur, <laughs> which means you are basically in those uh, in the foreign relations committee and in the uh, committee on the what's the next one? Uh, European affairs. Yeah, uh, so you're basically reporting on those two areas in the world. Yeah, of course. I, I mean, the, 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 I need to know all the whole the, the whole range of you know everything from China, Syria, and you name it. But you know, uh, we have experts. Um, so for 11 years now, ever you know, right from the beginning when I got the, elected for the first time in 2009 into the Bundestag and then the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, a little bit over 11 years ago, I was uh, the main or special rapporteur for transatlantic relations and also the Western Balkans, uh, which uh, Serbia, Kosovo, Montenegro, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Albania, North, now Northern Macedonia. Um, interesting with regard to <laughs> EU enlargement and also transatlantic relations. Okay. Next on this list is a member of the Interparliamentary Union, IPU, Executive Vice President, Southeast Europe Association. What is, what, what's the Interparliamentary uh, that is the, the, these, these are two, two things, actually. The IPU, the Interparliamentary Union, is a very, very, very old, uh, much older than the United Nations thing. <laughs> um, it's like the world parliament of all nations in the world. It's a little bit exaggerated, but it really goes back to the 1800 something when that was founded. And um, I have forgotten actually the number of member countries, um, but it's basically mirrors uh, the United Nations. So it's really like 160 or even more uh, uh, countries are members, um, but other than the United Nations where it's the nations, the countries themselves are members here, the parliaments are members. So it's a parliament of parliamentarians. Um, so there's a German delegation in this IPU um, consisting of a chairperson and then again, like a mini parliament. Um, so, uh, you know, all six uh, parliamentary groups in the Bundestag would send uh, their 
uh, their their members uh, identify one or two or three, depending on how how strong the the group in the Bundestag is, into this German delegation, and then we you know meet other, get in contact with other parliamentarians. Uh, usually, we meet in person, obviously, uh, you know, in Belgrade or Doha or some place around the world in in Congo or elsewhere. You know, it's it's not only really democracies. So that is really interesting. The completely different cultures that you know you meet there. Also, the Iranians. You know, there's um, and then then there's sometimes fights uh, only with words, but uh, you know, cultures clash, political cultures clash uh, against each other. Uh, but you know, the good thing is we, we want to understand each other better. And we also uh, uh, draft uh, resolutions that we then pass and so on. Uh, but also, and I would stop with that from that point is, um, it's interesting to observe how, you know, internal con political conflicts are brought into this IPU at times. So some, 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 some of, you know, within a, a delegation, which is, consists of political, uh, uh, a national delegation, which consists of national comp competing uh, 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 party representatives, they try to carry the, or their domestic political conflicts into IPU. And then that is something, you know, it's a waste of time. You're right, hey, let's overcome that. We are here as parliamentarians from around the globe and want to achieve something together. Very so interesting. Very yeah, interesting. So, yeah. Very interesting. We don't hear much about the IPU. So are there any? It's not, it's not very well known. Are there Quite any... frankly, uh, like seven years ago, I didn't know it even exists. <laughs> do, do, are there any decisions made? Do, any budgets? Any any anything? Or is it just a, a discussion? It's, it's more discussion, as I said, resolution and so on. But all of that is not legally binding. Um, that that is also, but you know, as long as uh, uh, we talk each other, and you know, we want to we want to enable, and we want to. We, we want to strengthen parliaments and give really power to the people, um, or to the peoples of this world. Um, I think that is that is that is actually a good thing. And as I said before, the United Nations do not have a parliament; it's only representatives from the countries. So that is really different. And there's a lot of talk. I mean, um, that this IPU idea, maybe the IPU parliament itself. Uh, could be attached or somehow brought closer as a parliament of parliamentarians to the United Nations. But, you know, that is something that still needs to be done. Okay. And, and then executive VP of Southeast uh, Europe Association uh, and, <clears throat> and president uh, of the Association of Silesia, Lower and Upper Silesia. Yeah, well, okay. There's a, the executive vice president of the Southeast Europe Association um, that is something that I've been doing now for, I don't know, four years or so, um, that, that, that goes together, uh, or actually it's complementary with my Western Balkans expertise and activities there. Um, it's not, it's not only focus of, of these, uh, this region, also Turkey and the Balkans as a whole and, and, and Poland and so on. Um, that, that is a, there's a lot of academia in the, in the, in the Southeast Europe Association, but also politicians. Uh, we want to reach out, you know, not among, also, but not only amongst um, uh, um, professors of history or politics or so on, but we want to uh, make contacts with rep political representatives, but also civil society in the respective countries of Southeast uh, Europe. And I'm quite, quite active there. Together with there, there's also a vice president from the Green Party, one from the FDP, so the Liberal Democrats, and one from from the SPD. We're all, all good friends. Uh, we've been knowing each other for a longer time. Very active. And only yesterday, I was sitting together on a on a virtual panel. We did a transatlantic workshop uh, with uh, Matt Palmer and the Department of State, uh, who's responsible in the DOS, has been responsible for many years. For, for, for the Department of State, for the US administration, for that region. And so we did a, a very good panel discussion on that yesterday as well. All right. And, and the, the last one is the Association of Silesia. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that is, some, that is a new addition to my web. Well, um, Silesia, well, that, this, this belongs well, to the, I mean, Silesia and so is now Poland, like Prussia or East Prussia. 
and Silesia, lower and upper Silesia, as in uh, what is it now called uh, um, after the Second World War, uh, Poland, part of Poland. But there are still a lot of people who, uh, who claim who have roots and still have relatives and, and, and so on, and then have their home villages and so in that region, in Poland, and uh, who were refugees when they were kids, for example. My mother, for example, she doesn't, she, she fled with her mother then as a, as, as a kid from, actually from, from, uh, uh, from, from East Prussia. So, I mean, it's a, it's a de 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 diminishing group of people because, uh, you know, they're getting very old. And, um, but, you know, I got elected president by, on that, for that organization for the whole of Germany. So I'm, it's, it's more a representative uh, job, but it's an honor. And also I have here in my district, not far from where I'm sitting now, it's a called uh, Landesmuseum. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a museum um, that deals also with this part, both uh, Prussia and, uh, no, actually only with Silesia and in, in Poland. Uh, so that the, the, the people have, uh, you know, can, 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 and can learn and keep up the tradition. And, you know, it's part of German and German Polish history. So um, that's what we want to keep that tradition of the culture alive, the language and so on. And also there's a group in the German Bundestag that deals with that. And there I'm also the vice chair chairman. But I, what I wanted to act because you jumped over that, I mean, I don't want to get bore everybody, <laughs> but the, the pace thing, the a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, PACE, if you can read it there. That is really interesting. That has nothing to do with the European Union. It's the Council of Europe. Uh, the Council of Europe is also uh, older than the European Union. It's much bigger, consists of 47 member countries. And we aim at um, you know, supporting uh, the rule of law, democratic structures, human rights, and so on. And then also their rapporteur in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe for Kosovo. All right, great. Thank you so much. That will clarify it. I um, will see when we when we will see you next. Um, how many more uh, functions <laughs> and, and, and titles uh, we have to explain? Uh, a real expert, not only uh, about transatlantic uh, relations, but also. Western Balkans, Silesia, I believe, is the the German uh, uh, Schlesian. Schlesian, yeah. Mm. Okay, very good. So we'll come to the next uh, window, which is the current time, the transition time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of us believe that uh, President Biden has been uh, uh, elected. President President elect Biden has been elected. Um, Mr. Trump uh, still refuses to some degree, um, at least in, in his public statements, to accept it. How, how do you deal with the current situation? Are you talking to the, 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 the current uh, administration and to the Biden administration? Are you holding back? Um, what, what's the uh, position and how does this work right now? I wish I could do both. Um, you know, so uh, I personally talked with the current uh, administration because I'm the council general would, could, could jump in if I'm uh, not completely mistaken. There's, there's this so-called Logan Act, um, uh, which uh, de facto does not allow um, the elected but not yet incumbent um, new potential uh, future administration to reach out to uh, foreign government representatives uh, and, and even not um, active uh, uh, politicians. Uh, we all remember quite well the so-called Russian collusion in 2016. That was exactly that fall under this Logan Act that uh, when uh, the president, President Trump has been elected, but it was the lame duck period, uh, president was still Obama and his folks, uh, but already this transition team members, um, uh, you know, <laughs> made contact to the Russians and that, you know, uh, th 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 then, I mean, there were these Mueller investigations. So nobody wants that. So they really, I mean, I, I tried a little bit knowing that, that it wouldn't be possible to, to reach out. But I mean, there had been this telephone call between Angela Merkel and Joe Biden. But apart from that, um, I mean, we, we have very good connections. Several of the guys who have been publi uh, publicly announced yet to, to join the cabinet um, uh, of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, 
um, uh, we, we would be knowing before, but it's really tricky um, to, to really establish contact. It, it would have been extremely important now to really work closely together, but um, what is uh, very, very important now to understand here on this side of the Atlantic, that we should not just wait until inauguration day on January 20th and then you know establish contact only on 21st and until, until then we do not nothing. No, people increasingly understand on this side of the Atlantic that there, we shouldn't waste any time uh, to sit back, relax and enjoy the ride. Um, I mean, you have, you have probably seen this, uh, that Heiko Maas, the, the foreign minister, together with his counterpart, Le Drian, uh, published, I think it was last week, uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post, which was, I think, a, a very well uh, recognized, um, strong European signal. Um, there are, there are concepts, also Heiko Maas presented five topics on a reset uh, in the transatlantic relations, you know, others speak of uh, we need a we need a new start I, or a reassurance, whatever you call this. I, I was I, I'm often talking about uh, uh, the, we have to build up the new West, um, but it doesn't matter how you label that thing. It's good that I think increasingly uh, increasing number of people and political decision uh, making positions understand that it's now the time. Um, to uh, you know, uh, identify our own expectances, uh, expectations, and try to define, to give answers to that. You know, to to the, what do we expect from future transatlantic relations? Um, you know, trying to come, taking into consideration what the Joe Biden administration might want, and we we're probably coming to that. What we think um, we could expect from the other side of the Atlantic, but even. Um, uh, you know, if you would just concentrate on ourselves, um, we have a good, good chance. You know, it's both. It's, a, it's an opportunity and a test. And I hope we will pass the test in delivering content and then really to make ambitious approaches. I'm realistic. I mean, um, I, I know that not everything will be fine. Uh, like all problems will miraculously go away uh, after January 20th and uh, all our transatlantic problems and conflicts where we, we would go we would somehow go away and, and vanish that's not the case but we we need to really take this serious we only have a very very short period of window of opportunity midterm elections are already around the corner uh, Joe Biden is not the youngest chap around uh, and Donald Trump will be around for some while midterms, maybe for himself running again in four years time or somebody from his family slash clan. I don't know. He has, I mean, the, the Republic Party cannot get rid of him. Uh, never had they had so many supporters before, uh, millions. Um, so um, we have to take that into account as well. Um, but I, I think I, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> so um, we, we're using the time actually, maybe I should say that uh, as I said, Heiko Maas, others, uh, Annegret Kam Karnbauer, defense minister, uh, has done uh, an excellent speeches uh, in, 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 um, here in Germany. Um, there's a lot. There's a bit of friction within the Grand Coalition government in Germany. Um, also, a uh, you know a, a little tension with the French. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. But what I can say for sure, uh, what the chairman of our coalition partner, Rolf Mützenich, said, we, you know, as a reaction uh, to the results uh, or to, the, to what's happening uh, after the uh, presidential elections in, in the United States of America, you know, is this still a democracy or not? We have to, uh, we have to decouple from America. Um, that was the stu you know that was so stupid it was it is a wrong answer on the contrary now we have to turn towards each other which leads us right into the window number four which is uh, you have published an, an article in ip quarterly uh called taking a stand uh where you strongly advocate for europe uh, to uh, make itself a little bit more at least self-sufficient and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and take a, a more um, prominent role. Germany 
a, a more prominent role in Europe, but also the European Union, a more prominent role in the world. Um, maybe you can give us your thoughts on that for a little bit. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Wolfgang. Um, um, you know, there, there's many things led me to write this article, which is only a, sh a, sh a small excerpt from what I really wrote, but uh, it was much longer. But um, so I tried, so, so some of the um, things that I you know, came to my mind was um, uh, we need leadership, political leadership here. We need to be, and we want to be a strong partner for the, for the, for the next administration in the United States of America. Um, I think we don't have really a choice, uh, but uh, to understand that only with the American friends as a strong partner, and also the Americans, hope, I hope they understand that they need uh, Europeans as a strong partner, can both of our nations, the USA and Europe, really um, um, save the secure stability and also the relative prosperity that we have. Um, only together are we strong enough to, to face that. But now sometimes, I mean, we've been talking a lot about the United States of America and transatlantic relations uh, in recent years and, you know, pointing a finger to Donald Trump, who, you know, was hated over here. Uh, nobody likes him. But, um, you know, uh, four fingers were always pointing, pointing uh, towards us. And I, I got increasingly concerned about the status quo uh, my country is in and the European Union is in. We have, uh, you know, we have um, uh, China as a big, big challenge. Um, there's this so-called 17 plus one format. There is this Belt and Road Initiative. And there are several European member countries uh, who, you know, are part of that, who, who, agree, who signed agreements for loans or other things with the Chinese. Uh, we have some issues uh, with regard to the rule of law in Poland and Hungary, um, probably in violation of the European treaties. So the Euro Europe, Europeans need to understand that with 500, around 500 million Europeans, together and also as a strong economy standing together, we can be a strong partner and we, we have to lead and we have to make decisions. There's, we have, you know, there's a lot of debate currently about um, Europe, Europe, Europe's strategic autonomy or strategic sovereignty. It's not only a fight about uh, words, it's a fight about concepts. I don't want a, an autonomy that Europe, Europe you know, becomes something like a fortress to, uh, that, that excludes our allies. Um, you know, there had been some miscommunication. Um, and anyway, I think it's legitimate that Europeans uh, are trying to build up a European defense industry um, that comes into play, the European Defense Fund. It raised eyebrows both in the Department of State and the Pentagon last year. Um, so uh, that is something that we need to take into account. We want more transatlantic cooperation here and not less, but also I expect from the American friends and understanding that now we're doing what you guys legitimately demanded on, from us for many years, that we take up more leadership, that we take up more responsibility and we want to do that. Um, and if you look to the digital world, um, we also want to build up a European digital infrastructure, a uh, German-French initiative called Gaia-X or a European data cloud. Also raised eyebrows and co deep concerns of the Silicon Valley especially. But I think um, um, it, now it becomes clearer that also that is not a digital fortress, uh, a European Union, but legitimately we want to set a legal framework and write down criteria what you, you know also with a with a with a uh, with some um, uh, quality data protection behind that um, that is also considered should, should also be considered as an offer to the American friends that they are that they could join so um, there, there's a lot a lot to do in that regard but I mean if you if you you know concentrate for a second on just on Germany on my country um, there, I mean, I think we, 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 we made ourselves too comfortable for much too long time. Uh, you know, the American friends uh, built up their protecting a nuclear umbrella 
above us. They are protecting us. Uh, we welcome U.S. soldiers here. We need them. Um, and uh, nuclear sharing is the key word here as well. I'm very much in favor of that. Everybody who's dreaming we could do without the Americans here is uh, nothing but a dreamer. It's not the right way to go. Um, but um, so yes, uh, but we also, uh, you know, we made our self commitments in 2014 that we want to spend more money on defense, increase our budget, uh, but by to, to up to 2% of GDP, for just on the defense spending side, we will not reach that uh, until 2024. Uh, we, we started to slow, we did a lot already, but it's not enough. Um, I, I want Germany to be a reliable partner for its allies in NATO and beyond. And I want us to see a more leading role, politically leading role. We are the strongest economy here on this continent. And um, we need to um, much, much better coordinate our foreign politics, defense politics, development uh, politics, and part of the economic politics as well. Um, so that's why in, uh, I also made this proposal, and I'm not the first one, but I'm very vocal on that in recent uh, months um, and in public, um, uh, that we need something like a National Security Council. Of course, not uh, anything exactly like uh, the Americans have, but the core, the, 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 you know, the, the lesson that we should have learned by now is that with today's structure and organization of the federal government here in Germany, which dates back to Konrad Adenauer's time, so over half a century, and has only been adjusted three or four times very marginally, with these structures of the past, we cannot find responses and really uh, give answers and, and politi show political leadership uh, uh, with regard to the challenges of today and tomorrow. So we need to coordinate these fields of politics much better. Um, and uh, I'm currently working on that thing, it's not just demanding this, say that we need that, but with regard to constitutional law or with regard to organizational structure and the legal framework, I've already written a lot down together with some professors in that who are experts in that their respective fields have a lot of experience. They're um, uh, also in the government, we're government officials. Uh, they're helping me there. And um, that would be the addition of the next piece that I would uh, uh, want to publish, maybe early next year. Great, thank you very much. Um, now, before I turn it over to uh, Jim for uh, whatever questions uh, he has fielded in the meantime, uh, Stefan, would you like to uh, make a few comments from the Southern California perspective? Southern California, yes. Guten Abend erstmal, Herr Bayer, nochmal. Merci, hallo. I hope that you will come to see us as soon as possible. Please push a bit the vaccine. And you can also perhaps, you are also perhaps within that discussion, you know, who will be prior, the prior um, vaccinated. So it's very important. So we can be all waiting for the decisions within the framework of the European Union, as we all know, that uh, the vaccine is not um, acknowledged simply nationally, but at European level. But we hope to see you very, very soon in person. And here, I just would like to add, when you're talking about transatlantic relations, I do think the aspect, I would like to use the word revitalization. Of course, we had also during the Trump administration good relations, but different, I would put it this way. And I also would like to, 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 to emphasize on this issue of multilateralism. Uh, for Mr. Heiko Maas, also he also had put this on his agenda, on Germany's agenda, that we, can truly hope that the United States will come back on track, to put it this way, when we talk about the Paris Climate Agreement, for example. And I even can find out some, uh, some foreign policy issues with California and Germany. We do have the green, green, new Green Deal of California that can really meet our program 2030. So there are very many topics we have in common. Also at, let's say, state California level and Germany. So this interesting aspect also we should tackle upon. And also when you're talking about getting back on, back on track, they are, and I always would like to underline, I'm sure that Peter Bayer is, agrees um, that the people to people approach still works very well. 
Because I do always have to explain to my friends in Germany. They tell me sometimes, hey, what you are doing in this country, it's, it must be hard for you. It must be so difficult. I say, listen, these are friends. It's a long lasting relationship. They are our partners. We are always reliable and they will be reliable. And it's a people to people approach. Of course, with all due respect for governments, of course, I represent my government here, but it's also on people to people. And Peter Bayer is also doing that also in person when he comes to, to California, for example. So that is very important. My message is like, we're looking, looking forward and there will be a revitalization and there will be kind of getting back on track. And I'm very proud to be a part of it. And I hope to, to be able to, to make my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Bayer, for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Chair. And I, I, I'd like to add uh, some uh, uh, statement that I have made to my German friends. Uh, obviously, we also have a lot of discussions with uh, people in Germany about this, how, what's going on in America, blah, 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 blah. And I, I have said several times, I still believe uh, in America very much so. And one of the things that I have learned uh, in the... Uh, close to 30 years that I have been here and before. Um, if you look at any Hollywood mu movie that is an, a famous American movie, uh, the storyline most of the time goes that um, there is some villains, there is some trouble, uh, but in the end, uh, the heroes in the, in the movie will do what the Americans call the right thing, uh, even though it may go across some, some rules, but generally the heroes will come out and uh, will do the right thing. And I still have a lot of confidence uh, that ultimately uh, America and the American people uh, are, are demanding uh, the right thing. So uh, with that having uh, said, uh, Jim, uh, what do we have uh, for questions from the audience? Thank you much. Uh, before I um, start opening up to questions, I'll give you some time to write some. Uh, please send me questions either to everyone or to my name in the chat box uh, on the bottom part for those of you new to Zoom or not familiar. Um, it allows you to open up a chat box and you can type in a question to me. And what I will do is uh, I will then call you up by name, whoever wrote that question that I'm calling up, and you can repeat that question face to face. As uh, following what Wolfram said early on, I'm only going to recognize questions from folks who have their video turned on. Uh, this is a face-to-face -face medium, after all. That's why we're doing it this way, all right? So please write your questions uh, um, into the chat. And while I'm waiting for the, uh, for the next couple of questions to come in, let me just piggyback on something that Mr. Bayer and Mr. Schneider said. Apparently there is a certain desire to meet face-to-face -face in person again, obviously, like many of us would do. And I just heard yesterday um, that they took the first step to do that that um, the Department of Homeland Security is recommending that the uh, restrictions on Germans and other members of the Schengen countries and some others may now enter the United States again. Uh, uh, number 45 still has to sign up on that one, all right? Uh, but that might be actually re reality. The second step is actually get the planes flying again. Actually, there's a third step, uh, allowing you, Mr. Bayer, also to travel again. I heard that uh, the Auswärtige Amt is still putting a kibosh on some, some travel. Um, so if, I think if all three steps are there, we can have a beer together again. That's a point, right? <laughs> you know, that that, that, that you know, makes me very, it makes me hopeful. <laughs> but you know, there are actually I'm, uh, there, there are exemptions uh, as far as I know because I've tried and asked. Uh, well, now I couldn't I fly? No. Well, apart from the image, if something happens, you know, why is it? Is world peace depending on your visit and your talks? Or is there something that you know? Of course not. But there are exemptions. I mean, it is possible if you have a diplomatic passport, which I have, but not as a diplomat, which I'm not, but every parliamentarian has a diplomatic passport, so I have it. And if you have a close family ties, yes, my, 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 my sister with her family has been living for over 20 years in San Diego. Uh, she's there and they all have dual citizenships. Um, so, but yeah, no, but still, I mean, of course I don't want it go to visit her and going like you want to go to Washington, Los Angeles for political talks and stuff, but you know, they wouldn't let me. So I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed. But on the other hand, you know, I talked to a lot of journalists uh, <laughs> and um, found myself at one point asking them, I mean, uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with, a, uh, with a twinkle in my eye, 
um, uh, you know, do you need an assistance? Because they got, because of the election of the campaign, everything, they got uh, quite a number of uh, exemptions. They could travel um, if, if they requested and, you know, Quite a quite a number of German journalists. So, but I was not allowed. I mean, being responsible for transatlantic stuff in the government in Germany, but well, I can't go. But no. uh, yeah, well, anyway. But I want to want to just um, uh, follow up on what Wolfram uh, said. That is something that really um, couldn't agree more because I, I was about to say the same thing um, uh, because I I mean with all the thing the. The division in the society, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, police violence. Uh, Donald Trump tweets uh, not acknowledging, you know, his that he lost and you know not accepting that, and before he used some language, and so on. You know that is disturbing, and I have my concerns. But when I when when people in Germany always ask me, you know, the journalists, um, yeah, what do you think? Is is it you know is this a democracy anymore? Is, you know what? I have all the trust and confidence in the world, in the in the people of the United States of America. Over centuries, they have proven uh, that they could overcome crises, not automatically, but they will reinvent or reassure whatever uh, themselves. Um, uh, if they need help, I mean, we are friends; we can help. But this is very domestically. And this is the big challenge for uh, the incoming president uh, to unite his, his people. I, I think it's a task that four years are not enough for that. Uh, but also that is, that is a lesson, or that is something that I expect personally, that Joe Biden and uh, his, his, his administration will be uh, bound so much domestically that they really need a strong partner for the things on an international scale. They need the Europeans. Uh, Joe Biden has stated publicly, repeatedly, something like that. So um, when he comes, when he travels and visits Berlin and Brussels, he will smile, he will be nice, he will have a backpack full of um, things that he expects from us. And we, again, that's why I said we should, you need to use the time uh, uh, to, to really be able to deliver when time comes. Okay, thank you. Um, our first question, and that segues actually into your earlier remarks regarding travel, comes from Justin Gaynor. And I'm just going to ask you to unmute yourself. Okay. And uh, there we go. I don't know. Okay. Justin, you're, the thank microphone you. is yours. Oh, thanks. Um, first, a quick thank you to GABA for getting so many guests that really know what they're talking about. Um, that's really unusual. And I appreciate the effort that this organization has put into allowing normal people like me to talk to people like Peter Beyer and yourself. Um, but on that topic, uh, we recently had a talk from, with you know, people from Lufthansa talking about airport safety and flying safety with COVID. And going back to the COVID question, how is the other travel in Germany uh, working with you know, uh, all the trains and, and just public transit around town? If you can't fly, are those options also very restricted? Yeah, th thank you so much, Justin, for that question. Really appreciate that. I want to first come back briefly to the Lufthansa. You mentioned Lufthansa. Um, some while ago, Lufthansa approached me, others as well, but me as well, and asked for support. And I, I think I can say this here because it's, it's, it's not a secret. They were quite smart. I mean, they were, were trying to find a way uh, that to make makes flying transatlantic flying possible again and safer that people do not get tested only when they already uh, landed in the United States of America or example Newark or LAX or wherever and only then you said oh well damn thing too bad you have to go back because you you have been tested positively um, return please that they say, well, we can do, we have test centers here in on German, uh, German uh, airport, uh, German airports. And before you enter the plane, you can get your tests, quick tests. And then if you're, if you're, uh, if, you, if you don't have the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, then you're fine, you can fly. So you don't have all that hassle of sending back and cost of So I don't know what happened to that. Um, there was of course a debate here in public saying, well, now you have to have, uh, you know, you, you, you know it's, it's a restriction, it's a, dis it's, 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 uh, it's a discrimination and so on. But anyway, so that reminded me when you mentioned Lufthansa. 
But now to your uh, question, uh, what is the situation now with regard to public transportation here? Um, you know, if you could say so, one good thing is I'm, I'm living like 20 minutes away from Dusseldorf airport. So usually I hear uh, early in the morning when they start because they don't, there are no landings and uh, takeoffs during night. So only they start at 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm still lying in bed and the window open and it gets loud. So that was something that has completely vanished. It has returned now. And I'm, I'm a frequent flyer, of course, between Dusseldorf and Berlin. I usually never take the train. Uh, now I'm also flying. I will uh, board the plane to Berlin on Sunday evening again and stay the next week in Berlin. We'll fly Friday next week back to Dusseldorf. Uh, that is okay. I mean, you have a distance there. You have to wear these masks, but um, there are only like two flights a day anymore. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's complete... Uh, almost a breakdown of, 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 uh, of the public, of, of, the, of the flight activities in Germany. Um, and as you know, we, we have finally a new uh, airport in Berlin, but that is a different story. Um, <laughs> um, trains, trains is something, um, I have to say that there was a time during the first lockdown that there was no flight at all. So I had to use the train, which is not bad. Sometimes I take the train, but usually if I can, I take a flight because it's really still uh, quicker. Um, um, it takes me four hours, 15 minutes to get from here to Berlin. So it's the other, other is 50, 50, five, zero minutes flight time. So it's, it's an advantage to fly. But you know, I was taking the trains, the ICE trains, which is fast uh, trains. Um, um, they were empty. They were almost empty. And that was, quiet and they were rushing and there was no and that was really striking that was really also something that we didn't know they were always exactly on time by the minute uh, usually you have delays right at least like 15 minutes or something but never late they were always on time because there were not so many people who delayed and, and so that was interesting but now the situation is of course um People are, uh, you know, the the, the I mean, it's it's not mandatory, but it's a it's a, it's a it's a very strict advice that only those people who really have to 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 take the train for business reasons, for example, should really travel. Not just like if you want, I don't know what for 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 um, spare time reasons. Only if you really need to use the train, only then use it, please. You always all the time you have to wear your masks all the time. Um, the controls have gone stricter. They were quite loose at the beginning, but they, they've gone stricter now, uh, become stricter now. And also um, they, um, it's only now possible to reserve a seat at the window, not at the aisle. I don't know what, if you don't reserve that you can just enter and if there's an aisle club, uh, a seat free, I think you can still sit down there, but uh, you need to leave uh, one seat uh, uh, free in between the next one but if you want if you go online or go to a travel agency and reserve a seat only possible at window seat so they try really to to um, you know uh, enforce the social distancing somehow so it really changes that you can feel okay thank you mr buyer um i have another question but i'm asking that person to turn on their video uh for that question oh tori okay i will turn <laughs> over the the um Microphone to Tori Harold. Hello, everyone, and thank you again, Gaba, for hosting such an informative discussion. Really appreciate it. Um, my question is uh, I have both uh, German and American citizenship. I currently live in America. I'm planning on moving to Germany at the beginning of the year. And I'm just wondering with my valid German passport and my valid American passport, are there any COVID restrictions um, placed on my being able to enter into Germany? Either I'll either enter into Germany through the US or through Canada, I'm not sure yet. But with yeah. the valid German passport, am I able to come in without a problem and then quarantine, I suppose? You have, you have the big, big advantage that you have to do citizenship. Yes, you are free to travel. Uh, some of my friends have dual citizenships, uh, and you know <laughs> they are. So, how do you do that? Yeah, you know, to pass two valid passports from 
to both countries. So um, yeah, quarantine uh, might apply, but otherwise it, it, uh, you're free to travel. Um, I, I, I recently had a, uh, a guy from, from, from Los Angeles who used to have uh, the dual citizenship German and US, but um, somehow um, you know, returned the German citizenship uh, has now US and New Zealand, I guess. I wanted to enter Germany for a very important business meeting. So that was really a tricky thing. It's uh, basically not possible, but you're, you, you should be fine. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, at this moment, I don't see any more questions in the chat queue. So what I will do at this moment, since we do have some time left, want to make good use of it, <laughs> uh, so we don't have visitors like you all, all, the, day, all the time, is uh, I'll just uh, look at the, um, uh, the, um, the gallery screen. If somebody wants to raise their hand and ask a question in person, they can do so, and I'll just uh, jot down their names. While we're doing that, I actually have a question. Um, yes. I understand that Mr. I believe Richard Grinnell is kind of a polarizing person, uh, to say it lightly, uh, assuming there will be also a change in there. What is the profile you would have like to have see somebody in that seat? Mm. <laughs> My good friend, Rick, Rick Grinnell, yeah. Oh my God, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have to say a little bit. I mean, we got along with, with, with each other quite well, I have to say. We, we both entered, uh, were appointed to our respective jobs almost at the same time, or at least I started on uh, April 11th, 2018 as Transatlantic Coordinator and he came in, he came to Germany as ambassador, US ambassador to Germany like two weeks or two or three weeks late, later. So almost at the same time, and so <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, it, it could, could could go on for hours, but I won't. Um, <laughs> uh, but then I, you know, he also, I mean, apart from being a U.S. ambassador to Germany with a completely different approach to this job than all the guy like John Emerson from Los Angeles or Phil Murphy from New Jersey, who's the government now, uh, there now, very good friends still in, in close contact with them. He, he was, Rick was completely different, was not very much liked in, by the Germans, uh, but I met him uh, again in the Western Balkans when he talked himself into this position of presidential special envoy for the for Western Balkans, serbia Kosovo dialogue. That was, I mean, um, anyway, so this guy is, uh, was around very intensely, had to deal with him did a lot with him, but now he's gone. Um, I hope that, that that's really uh, important that I wanna say is um, um, that I, I hope that the position of US ambassador to Germany will not again be vacant for so long. Last time it was 14 months, 14 months vacancy. Uh, Robin Quinwell did a great, no, it was Ken Loxton back then, did an excellent job. Now Robin is Chargé d'Affaires again because Rick Rinell is not an ambassador anymore for several months already. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we hear some speculation, some rumors who might come, who might not come. They're very good names uh, that I know, but maybe there will be a surprise, I don't know. Uh, but that would be really my wish. Um, it's important that, that I mean, this person will be the highest representative of the United States of America, our closest ally in my country, in Germany. So it's important, it's really important to have somebody there. Um, so, I mean, we of course uh, respect and ex anybody who will be sent here, uh, everybody will be welcome, but of course um, it would, it would be good to have somebody who's also convinced who believes in the, a revitalization, a reset, uh, a reassurance, a new West, whatever, and a revitalization of the transatlantic relations who, who, uh, who really plays a constructive role, who wants to reach out uh, to, you know, <coughs> to the politicians in Berlin, but also who shows an interest in the citizens and in the country. Um, that is something that I would like, like John Emerson and, and, and Phil Murphy and others, uh, J.D. Bindenagel, uh, you name them, like John Kornblum, they all were so interested also in the country and we're not just residing somewhere and really want to engage like almost 24 seven. We have not seen that in recent years um, and that was not, uh, not so good, um, you know, because the, the, the ambassador has a, has a job uh, what I would expect is to, um, uh, you know, as a, as a channel for communication and understanding. 
um, you know, that <clears throat> we have a chance uh, that, that uh, this person, that the ambassador understands the Germans better, not only the political universe in Berlin, but Germany and the Germans, but also that he explains also not only Washington and Washington politics, but the country. I mean, there's so much to learn about from each other and that there will be a lot of, uh, you know, meetings and encounters. And so that is something that I hope the, 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 the next ambassador uh, would also share that, 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 that definition of, of this job. All right, thank you. Uh, next question comes from Gunter Hoffmann. Uh, let me see if I can find him again. I just had him a second ago. You can just unmute yourself. Okay, here we go. Oops. Gunter, microphone is yours. Hey there, good morning or, or good evening. Um, and, and thanks for being available for this uh, uh, meeting, uh, Herr Bayer. Uh, so this goes back to um, uh, EMD just uh, published a report on digital competitiveness and uh, Germany went down from 15 to 18 from 2016 to, to uh, 2020. And it's, um, it's, it's sad to see. And I, I wonder what is Germany and the government doing to, uh, to really catch up on that? Oh yeah, um, well, I mean, we have to admit we, have, we, we are behind. Um, I think we have, we, we, we've started to do some right things but you know what is um, really important? Well, I mean, I, I sh there's. I mean, I, I still remember quite well after the next, after the last general elections that it was, you know, um, yeah, we needed state minister, deputy minister, or whatever for digitization, and uh, there was a lot of competition. And you know, I, I, I leave out the details, but there is somebody now in the chancery. Then we have. We have a digital here and there, and basically, again, speaking of not coordinating things, um, we could be much more efficient to boost that uh, digitization in Germany if we could coordinate uh, these things much better. These activities we have a lot of good activities. I don't know all of them, but you know, if I look out of my window here, I mean, it's dark outside because it's quarter past ten p.m. But um, and, you know, the the some of the local utilities company, the Stadtwerke, are much faster. They don't want to, you know, they, they, they at one point in time, the, the, the municipalities, the cities, they said, we cannot wait for really federal or from the lender side for, for, uh, the part, uh, wait for initiatives. We uh, take own responsibility and we, we are, uh, you know, uh, we, we are, we are um, um, trying to build a good, um, uh, broadband supply for our citizens. Um, believe it or not, I mean, I, I don't have broadband here where I am, right? Where I sit, I mean, I have good access and, 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 and it's okay, I can do these things. But uh, Germany is lacking behind when it comes to private households, but even more important to small and medium sized companies who are slow internet. And, but the, we are, I mean, there I, I see that, you know, it takes time, but, you know, several things have, have, have been done now. So I think we are, we are on track, but it, it was very late. We, we started very late. Um, what we also are not yet as good at as I would wish we, we would be is um, a private equity, equity, what we call risiko capital. Um, yes, we're doing it, we, we're doing a little bit, but the culture, the financial infrastructure has not yet been uh, developed to the extent we probably would need that to create more of a startup environment, especially in the um, high tech sector, not just like delivery here or something, but really um, to boost the, the, the ideas, the, innova the innovations here. I think that is also something that we are slowly learning. Uh, others are faster, so that might be an explanation why we really even, even um, fell down the ladder in the ranks. But um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not completely pessimistic. I see a lot of good ideas, uh, but we need to do more. Um, so uh, one thing I should add, in the last coalition agreement, so I mean, we are, that is, was three years ago, we, from our side, from the conservative parties, made it a point to put in a, uh, what is it called, innovation fund or something. I don't know exactly. I think something like an innovation fund uh, was very important for us. Uh, you know, I think, you know, put in a, put in a basket 10, 10 billion euros 
and with low bureaucratic hurdles, um, you know, give the money to, you know, uh, innovative young people and that they should do something with that. That has not yet become reality. And uh, in a little bit less than a year, we will have the next general elections. I don't know why that is not really happening. Uh, our, our chairman, Ralf Brinkhaus, and the majority leader in the, in the house, so to speak, um, he, he has demanded and many times that the government does something, may, may, implements that. But I, I, I really just don't know why this is not uh, moving faster because we need something like that. Okay. Peter, we really appreciate your time and I don't want to keep you all night. Um, do you want to give us a number of questions that you would still be willing to do before we wrap up here? Jim or me? I have one more question in the queue anyway. Okay. 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 Uh, Barbara, board member. Unmute. Can you unmute yourself, Barbara? Sorry. Um, okay. Do you think the US or Germany will release first a COVID 19 vaccine? <laughs> 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 You've heard that that uh, UK said that they will be the first ones, which led our German ambassador to to the UK, <laughs> Michaelis, who used to be the state secretary, deputy uh, uh, minister, uh, who is now the German ambassador. There, he, he tweeted something like, "Well, um, uh, the, the 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 British government should 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 acknowledge and should know better because that had been." and not uh, Great Britain's success. It was a joint effort across borders. It was also a transatlantic success. We should mention that because the, the image now is out there. You know, the Brits did it the, the best and the fastest, it's, uh, it's, uh, which is only half of the truth. I, I can tell you. I mean, we have um, Jens Spahn, our, our health minister, uh, together with Amir Laschet, my governor here, and my party chairman in, in Northern Westphalia. They were, I think it was yesterday or today, I think yesterday, they were doing a, 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 a joint appearance here in, in, in Dusseldorf and other, other, other cities of the regions where they want to, you know, build up um, uh, both vaccine centers and also uh, the storage places for personal uh, uh, protection equipment, uh, which they want 19 um, uh, storage places around the country. They are building that up. Um, so, and Jens Spahn also said that um, there's some likelihood that we start, we can start with uh, distributing the vaccines and give the vaccine shots before this year is over, but uh, for sure at the beginning of next year. So that is, that is the best I can say. I don't know who will be first, but uh, we will be quite quick. Yeah. All right, so there are no more further questions in the queue, so I'll turn it back over to Wolfram for any final words. If you unmute yourself, however, first. Or like Peter Altmaier says, unmute you, unmute you. <laughs> There's a funny, funny thing on YouTube. I think you can see, see that. It was some public video stuff and he was always saying to somebody, unmute you, unmute you. <laughs> it was so funny, anyway. <laughs> okay, so if I don't see any more raised hands, uh, thank you very much. Uh, to all of you for joining us. Thank you very much, Peter, for uh, uh, sharing your, uh, what is it, Wednesday evening with us. Um, it's been mm -hmm. fascinating as always, it's been great. Um, if we are not allowed to travel too soon, um, we may wanna ask you again in a few months after the inauguration and see where we stand. Would be my pleasure. But on the other, on the other hand, uh, we're, we're very much hoping that the travel restrictions, at least in general, seem to be uh, under discussion right now, which is a good thing. Uh, what I have read on the vaccine situation is United Airline planes have been chartered by the U.S. government. United Airline is flying vaccine mm -hmm. into all the major regions, into every state in the United States right now. The Pfizer magazine. Um, and supposedly the day the uh, uh, CDC uh, or the, uh, the FDA gives approval, uh, the next day we, we will start uh, vaccinating. I don't think, even though I've seen also reports that in Berlin, uh, the German government is setting up uh, uh, 
uh, in some big event spaces, uh, vaccination centers. Uh, so, so they're uh, not very far behind us, but it seems like we we might be the first ones. And I know, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump. It's interesting after the fact uh, has has summoned the CDC, the uh, the FDA people to the White House, probably after he heard from his friend uh, Boris Johnson that uh, they will allow it the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, 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 I mean, yes, I mean, but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, we should make it a global human effort because it's a global pandemic. Uh, humankind should stand together there. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous that I'm the first, you know, I'm taller than you and I'm, you know, it's, I mean, it's, you know, what, what really is good that yes, there was a lot of competition, but good competition for, yes, for being, for being fast to, to being fast in learning to understand the virus, to have that vaccine with a high grade of uh, effectiveness. And so in the end, you know, to me, I don't care who's like one week faster than the other. Okay, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. And I would like to thank everybody who's uh, uh, spent their time with us today uh, for your support of GABA. It's uh, important that we uh, we have your support. Thank you for your memberships. Uh, if you are not a member yet, please consider to become a member. Uh, we are obviously depending on these kind of virtual events at the moment to sustain our activities. I would also, uh, if you haven't been to a, the GABA website uh, recently, uh, encourage everyone to go to it. We've launched a new website uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, you'll hopefully find that uh, a significant improvement. And uh, Catherine, are you still on the call? Yes. Um, yes, do, I'm here. Do you, you want to tell everybody when, when our next uh, events are going to be? Well, we have two really exciting events. Uh, tomorrow is our film initiative event about stunt performers. And we have uh, two stuntmen and one stunt woman. Uh, very exciting. They will share their stories, movies, pictures. That's tomorrow at 6 p.m. And then on uh, January 14, we again have our economic and market outlook with Dr. L. Arian. Uh, that has been an annual event and many of you probably have joined before and um, Dr. L. Arian will come virtually again and uh, Frank Motek also will um, be the moderator again. So that is very exciting that we can offer this again and we invite all of you to join us again. All right, I will give uh, Stefan Schneider the last word and then thank you very much for, for uh, attending. Thanks, Peter Beyer. Stefan, your final take. Thank you very much, vielen Dank, Peter Beyer in Deutschland, in Ratingen. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfram, for this initiative. And Gaba, you're really great doing all this and sharing and bringing Peter Beyer to us because he is a very, very busy man. I can tell you, it's not so easy to bring people together from our political level, because for the time being, they're even more than busy, because there are very many challenges in Germany, not just the corona, but it's also a society thing. It's a gap in our society, and our politicians are working hard on it to close the gap. And this is something I, I would not like to have the last word, because Peter Bay is much more important than I. But as you asked me, um, from this perspective, from Los Angeles, I see there is some irritation in Germany, but I'm also proud to represent my country because things are going not so well in Germany, but better than we might think. And I do believe personally, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We should be strengthened and we should be just wise. And well, as a, as a citizen, I'm not uh, talking as a consul general, as a citizen, we can rely on the political level because we have the federal level, we have the lender, our states, we have the, the, the cities, and they all have to struggle with different corona situations and have to find and have to find a solution, a regional solution. And I, I hope I quote the Minister for Health correctly. Uh, Mr. Spahn said a couple of months ago, at the end of all this, we have to sometimes excuse ourselves to one another. I think he said something like this, I liked very much so, because we all know. We are, it's the Corona thing is a new experience for all of us, not just for Germany, it's for the, for the world. And 
it's like uh, I, I'm not a captain on a ship. I can imagine that if there's fog around you, you're always uh, traveling somewhere and there's a lot of fog around and more and more we learn what's behind the fog and that uh, we found the vaccine now. And I, I have to say it's, uh, of course I have a certain pride that, that in Germany, by, by a German Turkish couple, by the way, the vaccine was invented together with Pfizer. And this symbolized the great transatlantic relationship at this level, I think, Frank is speaking to realize where we have the new revitalization of our relations. Uh, suddenly, we have that vaccine. It's, it's a fantastic metaphor, I would say. And so it okay. makes possible that Peter Bayer comes soon again with a blue passport or the red passport, I'm sure. And, and just one, one point on the discussions, I think uh, Jim mentioned it. Uh, the, rumors that the uh, US uh, government would soon open up uh, the borders for tourists from Europe. What I learned, and it's not a secret, there are discussions going on, but we have to be just careful. Also, all decision makers live now in a very difficult times and to, to, to abide to all the rules of Corona in LA County, in Ratingen, in Berlin, or in, in Warsaw, it's so different. We have, to be, we have to be vigilant, we have to be careful, and we have to be confident in the, in the policy makers. I think that's the best thing. As we have the light at the end of the tunnel, in, at, in the time of Advent, it's even much better. Thank you very much, and um, all the best to, uh, to Ratingen, to Peter Bayer, and thank you, Orfran. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jim for, for moderating and Catherine for setting this up and hopefully we'll see many of you tomorrow uh, for this very exciting uh, film initiative event about the stunt people. Thank you. And Thank you very much Wolfram, Stefan Schneider. Um, take care, stay healthy and um, season's greetings. <laughs> Ciao.